This video is brought to you by Squarespace. In 1955, Boeing invited airlines to witness what they described as history in the making. A new type of passenger plane, it's like never seen before. But instead of a simple tour and flyby, the test pilot did a series of impromptu maneuvers that left everybody watching on the ground godsmacked. Twin barrel rolls at 490 miles per hour, proving not only the military performance of this new aircraft, but that the age of the jetliner had truly arrived. This barrel roll would cement the story of the first Boeing jetliner for generations and herald in a new era for aviation transport. But the story of the Dash 80 and its production model is fraught with fear, cunning and possibly the biggest risk ever. For you see, Boeing would bet the entire company on building a fully functioning prototype without any orders. This is the incredible story of the miracle plane. The first Boeing 707. After the end of World War II, the jet engine was seen as the next great leap in aircraft technology. Planes could fly further, faster and higher than ever before, and it would only be a matter of time before the technology made its way to the civil market. The first on the scene was the United Kingdom with the De Havilland Comet. Another success story is about to begin with De Havilland Comet as the title. Completely redesigned from the earlier models after a series of crashes in which 110 were killed. Comet. Unfortunately, there were well-publicized flaws with the design that led to several crashes and loss of life, causing the public to reject the press's obsession with the technology. But the barrier had been broken, and several firms were now examining their own tank on a new fangled jetliner. Boeing, with experience themselves building large jet aircraft like the B-47 only a few years before, realized that they had the technology and the prime position to build the first American jetliner. And this was a huge deal. While Boeing was successful in the military market, it struggled with the civil market for some time. Its competitor, Douglas, had orders in spades for piston aircraft like the Douglas DC-4 and DC-6, which it had refined over many years, and airlines couldn't quite understand why they would need one powered by jet engines instead. This is the story of a few weeks in the life of an airplane, of a very particular airplane, one of the planes which is changing the whole idea of air travel and transport. A big, reliable Douglas DC-6. So Boeing decided that the best way would be to show, not tell, and build the aircraft of the future. Now, if it was me who was trying to build the aircraft of the future like you can see here, then I couldn't do it without a Squarespace website. That's right, if you're starting a brand new aircraft venture or perhaps any type of business at all, then you definitely need to check out Squarespace. Not only are their websites already fully optimized for mobile phones, and for those who are thinking about aftermarket sales for their new jetliner, Squarespace already has e-commerce tech built into most of their websites. To launch your own website, go to www.squarespace.com found. And you also get 10% off your first site and domain. Back to the show. But building a new jetliner from scratch wouldn't be easy, and Boeing would need to take out multiple loans and favors to do so. They set aside $16 million, the equivalent of $154 million today, with no committed customers, just a handshake from Pan Am. The project would get the juicy name of the Boeing 367-80, but would be called Dash 80 within the company almost right away. And it would borrow heavily from other large aircraft designs, such as the KC-97 Stratofreighter, such as the pod engines under the wings, and the same swept wing. A wing which would allow, by the way, the plane to fly faster than any of the other competition in development, such as the DC-8. 
Initially, the plane was going to be as wide as the KC-97, allowing five seats across the cabin. But the CEO of American Airlines at the time, C.R. Smith, said that he wouldn't even consider buying it unless they could pack in six seats, making this already large aircraft even bigger. To really punch out the cabin experience, Boeing would then hire industrial design firms from outside the company to create the new jet age interiors, a first for the industry. By early 1952, the board of directors was confident enough with the design to go public, and they revealed the production model as the Boeing 707. While the name today is quite revered, back then it was a simple escalation of the next product line for Boeing. The Boeing 300 being passenger prop planes, the 400, 500 and 600 series already reused by missiles and other products, so Boeing decided that jets would bear the 700 series numbers. The 707 was chosen over the 700 simply because they liked the ring of it. But building an aircraft is one thing, selling it is another. 18 months later, the plane was ready to pitch. Boeing started to do test flights with the first taking to the sky in July 15, 1954. As it was built by hand, yes, the whole plane, it could be custom built for any specifications. As Boeing was gunning for a military tanker contract at the same time, they would fly the new Dash 80 with a refueling boom attached to show off its capability and eventually win the contract, calling it the KC-135. You can of course check out all about the project here on my good friend's channel, Pilot Photog, and I'll have a link down in the description. With the military application sound, it was now time to approach the civil market. Bill Allen, the chairman of Boeing at the time, realized that plenty of aviation stakeholders would be at the Seafair Cup Unlimited Hydroplane race in Seattle. If he could get permission to run the new Dash 80 over the audience, it would not only prove that the concept was ready to go, but also give them a huge media boost. He had no idea what was about to happen. The test pilot of the Dash 80, Tex Johnston, wanted to prove just how insane this new aircraft was by performing a series of high turns and a barrel roll. While impressive, a barrel roll doesn't have any more g-forces than a normal flight and thus was relatively safe, but still of course would risk a multi-million dollar aircraft. On his first pass over the event, Johnston, without informing anybody on the ground or even on board, performed the maneuver. The crowd went ballistic. Then after turning around, he performed it again. I knew that no one would believe what they had seen, so I turned around and I came back and repeated the same thing on a westerly heading. When he landed, he was summoned to Allen and explained that the process was harmless. In reply, all he got was, You know that now, we know that, but just don't do it anymore. But this barrel roll would cement the future of the 707, and the extreme performance would put the public at ease to pressure problems that plagued the Halavan Comet years earlier. And then the orders started to flow. With the prototype a big success and deals in their back pocket, Boeing went on to produce the first production model, the 707-120, on December 20th, 1957, with it being certified and entering into service with Pan American in 1958. And seriously, I cannot overstate just how much of a big deal this aircraft was for the world of aviation. Almost right away, the aircraft changed the way we travel a long distance, taking over trains and boats for that coveted top prize. Over the years, many airlines would expand with the 707, and importantly, it also outpaced the rival DC-8 when it came to sales. I mean, ask yourself, have you heard of Boeing or have you heard of Douglas? But 6534 will never grow old. She will always be a new airplane. And Boeing would continue to improve on this design, creating a bespoke version for its first international sales to my very own Qantas, who would operate the aircraft for its long overseas flights, as well as a shorter version for short-haul flights called the Boeing 720. 
This plane was a huge success for the company, with 110 aircraft being built over the course of the aircraft's run. The only reason it was stopped was that Boeing was a victim of their own success. Essentially, passengers were hungry for bigger and better planes. Boeing now had to deliver and the 707 was now just too small. But the story of the Boeing 707 successor I think is best left for another day. Of course, the 707 wasn't the only aircraft that Boeing built with the Dash 80 prototype, but also the incredible air refueling tanker, the KC-135. My good friend Pilot Photog has a fantastic video that you can go watch right here, right now. Special thanks to all the Patreons who made this video possible.